Uh, I'm Lee Calcote. I'm a founder of Layer 5. I'm a Cloud Native Ambassador. Um, we are here today to, to talk about tales of the Kubernetes ingress networking deployment patterns for external load balancers. So uh, today I'll be moderating our webinar. Uh, I, I am joined by our presenter today and I'd like to, to welcome uh, Manuel Zapp, a solution architect at Continuous. Hi Lee, so, thanks for having me. There's Manuel. Very good, so um, let's go ahead and, and get started then. So just as we do, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, all of your questions are encouraged. Manuel is here to, to take them on. Uh, but of these housekeeping items, I, I do want to, to let everyone know that during the webinar, um, you're not able to talk as an attendee. Um, that said, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop your questions in there. Um, and we'll get to them um, as we go. Um, likely we'll hit those at the end if there's some urgent ones and, and we, um, we may, Manuel, forewarning, we may interrupt and, and ask an urgent one, but um, but, but please submit your questions in there, they will be answered. So this is an official webinar of the CNCF. And so as such, it is um, subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please don't add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. You know, essentially, please be respectful of your fellow participants and the presenter. And with the housekeeping out of the way, um, let me welcome Manuel and, and uh, hand it off to you. All right, thanks for handing it over to me. Um, hey all, welcome to this, webinars, uh, this webinar today. Uh, as already introduced, we're going to speak about tales of the Kubernetes ingress networking deployment patterns for external load balancers. Um, just like one organizational thing first, I will keep this slide open for like 10 to 15 seconds in case you want to follow this the slides online while I'm, uh, while I'm talking. There we go. So as already introduced, my name is Manuel Zapf. I'm uh, 30 years old, living in Germany, so all good. Um, I'm currently working as the head of product open source at Continuous, um, as Lee already mentioned. Um, you can find me on Twitter or on GitHub. Um, I'm happy to also answer questions later there or receive your feedback for the talk or whatever you want to, uh, you want to talk with me about. Um, as mentioned already, I'm working for Continuous, so uh, we, we believe in open source. We are the company that delivers traffic, traffic enterprise edition and mesh. Um, we also offer commercial support. Um, we are currently around 30 people distributed around the globe, whereas around 90% of our, of our people have some sort of tech background. So um, yeah, we, we try to take all the knowledge we have and make our products uh, the products. Our, our user base and especially the cloud native landscapes needs. Um, with that being said, um, without further ado, I would like to take it to the actual topic, um, which is deployment patterns for external load balancers. Um, however, we need to start first at the ground. And this is, of course, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, usually, or how a Kubernetes cluster is, uh, is built, and you probably all know that, is the cluster is made out of nodes, and these nodes uh, uh, have pods. That's essentially it. That's where the schedule of pops, pops workload, workloads on, and we go from there. Um, the first thing that, uh, that already happens then is pods have private IPs. So in case like pods want to talk to each other, or traffic should be routed from the outside to these pods, um, things will get a bit tricky um, because like they just have private IPs, they can they just be addressed on the node by default. So there's like there's like a gap, let's say. Uh, luckily, Kubernetes has a has a resource to overcome this challenge, which is a service, and the service comes right uh, comes right for your rescue in that in that case. Uh, a goal of the service is to expose pods to allow incoming traffic, no matter like where it comes from. So as you can see, like pods could be grouped together to a service, and then these pods could start could start uh, talking to each other because traffic will just uh, will just th uh, flow through it. As the diagram might suggest, there can be multiple pods uh, grouped in a service. So somehow, service are load balancers. Um, services can have multiple endpoints, which can be none or n or one. Um, and these endpoints are usually determined by the Kubernetes API. So Kubernetes API, like 
decides given certain factors um, what are the possible endpoints for for services to route their traffic to um, how it does determine that well one thing of this is that services can have different types um, we can we can group these services into two major uh, made two major directions, let's say, um, because these kinds are different or enable you to use uh, to use one or the other given the use case you have. Um, if you want to think about like from inside the cluster, which we could then take the inside type, the default type is cluster AP. Or if you think about exposing your services uh, from the outside or your applications from the outside, um, you would go like for one of the outside types, which could either be no port or load balancer, for example. Um, so at first we will have a quick glimpse about these service types. And of course we start with the service type cluster IP in that case. If you deploy a service with the type cluster IP, uh, this service will receive a virtual IP, which is private to the cluster. What that actually means is that this IP is just viable inside the scope of the cluster and it works within that cluster. So um, if you want, for example, that the pod on this node want to reach like this node, uh, the pod on this node, for example, you would go through the service cluster IP or through the service which is exposed by the type cluster IP. This would be a virtual IP then, and this service would then like connect to this pod or this pod, making the connection work to pods scheduled wherever on which node on the cluster. So it can be any node to any node. Um, as this works fine for, um, for, for communication inside your, like within the Kubernetes borders, within your clusters borders, that is certainly not enough if you want to expose an application to the outside. The first, the first thing we want to look in this scenario is uh, having a service of type node port. If you go for a service of type node port, what it basically does is it uses two different things. It uses at first public IPs, which your nodes might be uh, might might be addressed with and might be like responding on, and it needs ports on these nodes. Based on that combination, it forms some sort of routing grid. Let's say um, what a service of this type usually or does is it opens a port on any node uh, inside the cluster. So let's let's take, for example, we, we deploy the service with the type node port and it acts on port uh, 30500. It would open this port on any, on any node. If now a client wants to like connect with a certain application, um, he would go for, for, for a nodes, uh, uh, he would go for a nodes public IP on port 3500, which is like handled by the service and the connection would then go straight to the pod. So this is a kind to, to expose your application um, easily, let's say. Um, that taking a step further, the second type we have is a type load balancer. It's a bit the same as node port, except it requires and uses an external load balancer in front. So you have like the external load balancer as a service, which is running a, a front. And from there, it would go, as we've seen before, to the node port and from there to the actual pod. But for easiness, we just go currently straight from the external load balancer to the pod. So instead of the client would target or try to connect with, an, uh, with a node directly, he would connect with the load balancer and with the load balancer straight through. Um, as this seems to be good, um, services are still not enough. Let's take a context that we want to expose um, a bunch of applications externally. Um, as typically, or at least in cloud environments, let's say, um, the, uh, especially if you deploy a service with type load balancer, there will be a dedicated load balancer resource inside the cloud for you, which will either be then a machine or a dedicated appliance or whatever. Um, this will also like, of course, uh, require a public IP because you need to point to something. Um, and if you then think one step further, for example, for Amazon load balancers, let's say, um, you might have, you know, th these are typically exposed by CNames. So you might have to create a bunch of CNames on your own to like link to the load balancer, which is exposed for your application and stuff. So just managing those DNS records will be, uh, will be a nightmare. Um, additionally, 
as you have multiple multiple instances or multiple resources, you have no real centralization of everything or of anything. Sorry. So either if it's TLS certificates or logs or whatever, everything is basically managed on its own, and you don't really have you don't really have a good way to to shorten that. Um, as this is quite quite a problem. Kubernetes, ex, um, Kubernetes allows for a different concept, which is a step further, which is the ingress. Um, in this example here, we're using traffic as an ingress controller. What it then does is um, it, it's exposed over a service of the type load balancer, what we just saw. Um, but instead then, the ingress controller is like reading the ingress objects inside your Kubernetes cluster and make sure that your service then routes to your to, to the pods of the service it needs it needs to have. So you have some sort of an intermediary there because the request hits the controller and then goes to the pod. Um, some notes about uh, about the ingress though. Ingresses are standard Kubernetes applications. So they're typically deployed as, as pods, which is these days either a deployment set, a uh, deployment or a daemon set, sorry. And from there, they are exposed, um, exposed through, through the service object we just thought. Um, you still need to access these somehow from the outside because it will be like potentially your applications, but Ideally, you only have to have to serve uh, have to deal with one service now because um, because your Angus controller will take care of it. How that looks from like a connection standpoint is that the Ingress have has services as well. So, if you go from the outside, you have your public domain or your IP, which then points to your to your to your service of a type load balancer, which in reality is uh, like an external load balancer. Uh, from there, it will get forwarded to the Ingress controller, which is typically a pod running inside your Kubernetes cluster, um, which then goes for the service of the service you want to expose, which is then just a private service of the type cluster IP. And from there, you can go uh, to, to the pod that is uh, wanted for your, um, for your service. Um, why is this actually cool? Or to ask it the other way around, why should you actually care about this? Um, it's, it's a simplified setup because you just have one entry point, a single entry point, uh, which, which takes care of it, um, which results in less configuration because you only have to configure one instance instead of, um, instead of multiples. That also leads to less resources used because you might just have one this, or you might just have one single uh, load balancer, for example, which targets the entry point instead of having multiple. Um, and what this actually makes cool is if you if you take an ingress controller for example you can achieve a separation of concerns quite easily because the ingress controller takes like care of it so you can you can have different load balancing algorithms for example or circuit breakers or retries or whatever and just the the ingress controller uh takes care of it instead of that you need multiple layers let's say um but what does it actually? Uh, what what what, uh, what what does it actually bring? What could be hard with it? Well, by design, ingresses are for simple HTTP or HTTPS cases. Um, they are virtual host first centric. Let's say so. For all that know, ingresses, and I guess that's the most of you. Um, you can set a host name, where to react on, and you can set some paths and stuff, but it's always centered around that host name. So it's really it's really designed to help in the HTTP HTTPS case. Um, it can be used with TCP or UDP, but it's definitely not a first class citizen because, like per per specification, it is designed for HTTP or HTTPS. That could lead to the feeling that you really have to carefully select your ingress controller because, because like that's the one consuming your ingress objects and then making sure somehow magically that your that your pods are actually being uh, actually are receiving traffic. But it's a little different in Kubernetes because Kubernetes gives you the freedom. You can use multiple ingress controllers if you want. Um, how this works is. What you have in Kubernetes is the concept of annotations, let's say. So it's some sort of meter information you can attach to an object. And the de facto standard annotation is ingress class. So let's say you just have multiple ingress controllers in your, in your, in your, in your environment deployed. 
by just setting these annotations, the meta information, and giving it basically the class, um, you could select which ingress controller will take care of which ingress you just deployed. So if, if you need multiple ingress controllers, because maybe not one ingress controller has all the features you need, you're welcome to deploy multiple and just uh, just uh, control it by the annotations, which one is actually responsible for working on which particular ingress. Kubernetes gives you all the choices you need in that, or gives, it gives you the freedom for all the choices in that you need. There are so many deployment patterns that you can literally do almost anything. It really always depends on the case and then target uh, where, which pattern might be, uh, might be uh, your, your most desired one. All right, um, I already touched this briefly in terms of type load balancer. I said there might be an external load balancer before, um, but well, well, what does it actually mean? Um, external in that case means outside of the borders of Kubernetes. Um, mostly if you're run within ca uh, cloud, cloud environments, for example, on Amazon Cloud or Google, uh, Google Kubernetes Engine or whatever, um, this runs outside of, of your actual uh, of your actual platform, either in infrastructure, uh, like on-prem or cloud, and there it can just depends on where it actually runs. Um, however, it doesn't mean that this piece of, of, uh, of technology is not managed by Kubernetes anymore, because what typically happens is um, that by automation, something is listening on the Kubernetes API, like the load balance provider is listening on the Kubernetes API, um, and did write code for his operators, modules, plugins, call it whatever you want. And as he's listening on the, on the Kubernetes API, he sees that there is, for example, a new service deployed, which has the type load balancer and takes the management away from you and does everything it needs to do. Uh, in case you are like on bare metal, so there might no API for your cloud balancer provider or your load balancer provider does not have Kubernetes support, You'll be, you will be required to switch back to a service of type Nordport because as we just learned, they are literally the same except that there is an external load balancer. And if there is none, switch back to Nordport, all good. To sum that up, and I already managed uh, hit that briefly, what you will do is hardly depending on which Kubernetes distribution you are currently using because that will, that will decide um, which load balancer solution you should use. If we have a quick look at the actual Kubernetes distributions, we have like three different flavors, let's say. Um, the first is definitely cloud managed Kubernetes. Um, you all know GKE, EKS, AKS, uh, DigitalOcean, whatever. Um, that's, that's cloud providers that manage the Kubernetes for you. And usually, they also provide their own external load balancer solution. How that works, and I already explained this quickly, there's like a fully automated management through the Kubernetes API. So you just do what you need. You, do, you expose your service by type load balancer, and the API kicks in and makes sure that, uh, that the load balancer resource is created as you need it, or as you want it. Um, that, of course, results in really a great user experience because based on the integration, for use and end user, it just works plain out of the box. You just have to do anything more. It just works. Also, you're very beneficial uh, from all the benefits the, the cloud provider provides you. Um, high availability, performances, all of that. You just have that because like the cloud provider takes in, spawns the resources for you. So you use a product of your cloud provider. And of course, you, you immediately have all the, uh, all, the, uh, all the benefits he offers you. There are a couple downsides, of course, to this as well. Um, of course, you have to pay for this. I mean, the cloud provider is not like doing it because he's super nice to you, because they need to earn money, and that's fine. As already mentioned, um, configuration can be done using annotations. And as this is a cloud-specific annotation, configuration can change. So it can be that in your, let's say you use a load balancer, like you have your cluster, for example, on Amazon and you switch it over to, to Google Kubernetes. Uh, it can happen that you have to reconfigure it by like finding the other annotations and stuff. Um, that there is no standardization in it. So you just pop in your, your meta information, which is basically just key value, and from there it can change. 
of course, also um, what you can configure actually relies heavily on the actual load balancer implementation. So whatever limits the load balancer in front of you has, you are working within these limits. The second approach is, uh, sorry, the second approach is uh, bare metal Kubernetes, or also known as run it on your boxes. Let's say you're just taking some, some droplets or some EC2 instances or whatever, and are managing Kubernetes on your own. Then from our, from our experience during the last month, the best approach is to use something as Metal LB, which is a load balancer implementation for Kubernetes, and this one is running actually inside your Kubernetes cluster. What that means is that Metal LB uses all Kubernetes primitives you have. So um, it's deployed like a typical Kubernetes application, but has all the benefits as high availability and stuff. Also, it, uh, it operates on the layer two, or it can operate on the layer two, on the network layer two, which is routing, as well as BGP. The only bad thing is, they are still considering themselves not as uh, production ready. They are keeping it as sort of, yeah, we are working in a beta state, take care of what you do. So of course you have to take care of what you do. Um, and if for that reason, for example, you, won't, you don't want to use something like Metal LB, an option you have is, an ex to, is to use an external uh, static load balancer, something that has been done uh, for quite some time by now. But again, this requires you to switch back to the service uh, to the service type node port, because you need a target you, that your external load balancer targets, and that is typically a combination of nodes and ports. And so that's exactly where the node port service uh, has its strength and comes back in. Last but not least, um, we also have something which we call the cloud semi-managed Kubernetes. Um, this is also heavily depending on the actual config provider, like if you're running on cloud or like completely bare metal inside your, um, inside your, uh, inside your data center. You then need a tool for managing those clusters and you typically know them as like cube ADM or cops or there are some more. Um, if you use th these tools to manage your Kubernetes clusters, they sometimes um, also already manage the load balancer if, and there comes the co compute provider uh, back in, if the compute provider offers something like this as well, then it can manage this for, this, for, for you. Okay, as we now have explored some, some ways how this actually operates and what are the actual ups and downs, um, we go back to, uh, to, to why is this all important? Um, what, what is really important in terms of having the network running is the source IP. Like we want to know who is currently emitting requests because sometimes business managers um, have these, these requirements for various of reasons. It can be that they need to know the IP of the, of the emitter of the request, like to track usage, to potentially bill the right, the right person, uh, write access logs, have it for legal reasons, whatever. There can be really a, a wide variety on, on cases for that. To make that happen, things can get, can get a little tricky, let's say. Um, because what happens then is NAT. NAT stands for Network Address Translation. And in, in an IP version 4 world, the router masquerades IPs, like really the network piece, um, to allow routing from one, diff from one network to another different network. This process has like two sub-processes, let's say, uh, which is uh, at first DNAT, which stands for destination uh, NAT. In that case, the router actually masquerades the destination IP um, with an internal pod IP, and we will sh uh, see a chart for that in the next slide. And the other option is a source NAT, which is SNAT. Um, and that does actually the other way around. It masquerades the source IP with the router's IP. So if we take a quick, a, a quick look at it, um, just in an example, we have just a setup with a client, a router, and a server. The client is like addressed with this IP, the router with this IP from the external. And from the inside, the router just has an external IP and the actual server also. So in case of destination app, the client tries to connect with the IP address uh, like this, so the packet reaches, uh, reaches the router. It still, of course, has the source IP correctly set from the client. The router then does the destination, uh, the destination app, so it masquerades 
the destination IP address, um, uh, the, 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 the outer destination IP address with the IP address of the server in the inside, but keeps the source IP. In case of, uh, of source net, um, he does the other way around. So the request goes to the router and the router masquerades the source IP with being the router as if he would be emitting the actual request and stays with the destination address and forwards it. So that's a bad idea because as we just said, our business manager wants us, wants us to actually preserve the source IP. So our, our golden rule is uh, to not want a uh, source net to happen because that will lose us the source IP and we cannot like fulfill our business manager needs. Therefore, the actual challenges with, um, with intermediate components such as, for example, an external load balancer, um, they can interfere into this process and potentially make SNET to happen in like one of the steps, which could make us uh, the source IP lose. So if we now take a look inside actual Kubernetes, we have kubeproxy. What is kubeproxy? Kubeproxy is a Kubernetes component running on each worker node. Um, the reason we have kubeproxy is we need someone to actually manage virtual IPs, uh, which are used by the services, and we need to like have something uh, to like pass it. The challenge with this is that given the case, kubeproxy might actually ask not requests, um, and that depends heavily on, on the service type. As we just learned, there are like three different service types and on these service type, it depends on what kubeproxy will actually do. So let's do a quick tour of these. This, the first we have a look at is uh, source IP or the case source IP with a service of type cluster IP. Usually, or by default, let's say, kubeproxy is, uh, is deployed in the IP tables mode, which is good for what we need, because in that case, no SNET will happen, because there will be no intermediate component. So the client requests the service of the cluster IP, which, is, uh, which configures kubeproxy, and we just go straight to the pod. So there's no one in between which like tampers with requests or might like it might rewrite packages or whatever. So we just have cleanly the source IP of the request emitter and we're good. Things get a little more complicated when we go to services with the type node port, for example. Um, because let's have a look at what actually happens. The client requests one of the nodes. Let's take node node one in that example on the port we just exposed. And kubeproxy sees okay, here, here, here's no pod to go to. I need to go to second node and check if there's the pod. So he SNETs the original requests in order to forward it to another node inside the Kubernetes cluster. So at that, that point, we already lost the source IP, the, the, the source IP and kubeproxy then forwards it to the pod running on the node. So we lost. Source IP lost, we, we, we can't fulfill our business manager um, needs. With another, uh, with another or another variant, let's say, of services having a type node port, what Kubernetes offers is something that is called external traffic policy. You can basically configure this service a bit. If we configure it and set this policy to local, we, we actually have the good thing that no, um, no, no source node will happen, but we also have a downside. And let's have a, have a look at it. Um, the client goes for, Again, node one goes through the port, goes to the uh, kubeproxy, and kubeproxy sees, all right, I don't have the pod running on my node. And as the external traffic policy is set to true, the, the request will drop here because there is like no, no pod to locally forward the traffic to, so he just cuts it. In the other way, the client goes to the other node having the port opened. Kubeproxy knows, all right, I have the pod, and just it goes through. And in that case, because there is, again, no intermediate component, we have a source IP. Now, the service type building up on this is load balancer. Um, and there, by default, SNET is done, same as node port, same reason. Um, it just doesn't work. The external load balancer can route to any node inside your, inside your Kubernetes cluster. And if on the, on the node receiving the request is no local endpoint, Kubernetes will forward it to another node and then SNOT will happen, so source IP lost. 
However, there is also another, another way. Um, we can also set this local external traffic policy. And there are a lot of load balancers actually implementing this. For example, on Google Kubernetes Engine, the Google Cloud Load Balancer, or the Amazon NLB, or whatever. What happens then is that nodes without a local endpoint will have failing health checks because there is like no one responding on the port. And therefore, these nodes will like rotate out of, of let's say, the target group the load balancer is forwarding the requests to. This is, of course, nice because you have no requests dropped uh, from a client perspective. Everything works. And um, as the health checks are like making sure that all my nodes are healthy because that's the job of the checks, they are always ready. So that, that's, that's perfect. However, the only downside here is it relies heavily on health check timeouts. So if health checks are a bit too slow to happen, you might potentially forward requests to, to like unhealthy nodes as usual, and then your, um, and then your request might be dropped. What we already know is that sometimes um, source not is mandatory. Some, sometimes you just can't go, um, so sometimes you just can't, can't, uh, can't evade it. Um, usually it happens with external load balancers, as we just uh, heard. Also, there can be network constraints that force SNAT to happen. Or, for example, in case of an ingress controller in the middle, because there's like another component which, which does the job of routing. And you might also need to forward uh, requests to other nodes and stuff. So we have the same problem again. But as we already figured out, network is based on layers. So we have like seven layers by default in the network. Um, and maybe why don't we try to tackle this issue um, with, with, with moving this issue to another layer? So in case of using HTTP, which is also the prime, the prime citizen of Ingress, for example, uh, we can retry the source IP from the actual headers. If we are going for TCP UDP, uh, we could use the proxy protocol, which might help us in this case. Or also an option would be to use distributed logging and tracing because our manager just wants to have it early in the cycle and the flow, sorry. And if we have it in other systems, that could also work as well. So let's have a look at the HTTP part first. Um, we have headers inside HTTP because they are like part of the protocol. And one of the headers is X forwarded from. This header typically holds a comma separated list of all the source IP that has been like placed in this header due to network ops with SNET uh, taking place. The good thing is lots of external load balancers or also ingress controllers are supporting this header. So in case they receive a request, they need to forward it somewhere else and need S not to happen. They just put in the, the, uh, their current client IP back in the header. So your actual application running in the pod can still figure out who was this, the original source caller because he just parses the header basically and sees, all right, the first IP was this. Okay, that's my source. As we see, the header is starting with an X. So that means it's not a standard header, um, which means that not all HTTP appliances might actually support it. This has been uh, recognized, and therefore there will be an official HTTP header called forwarded, which will do the same job, but as it's like a default header um, or an official header, all appliances should support it, and we will have at least some parts of this issue uh, solved. The second option we wanted to have a quick look at is uh, Proxy Protocol. So Proxy Protocol was introduced by HA Proxy, which is another reverse proxy solution. It happens at layer four, which is the transport layer in uh, TCP UDP. And the goal of, um, of uh, Proxy Protocol is to chain proxies without losing the actual client information. So even, even if the request is passing through the proxy, the goal is to not use the source IP. Luckily, the proxy protocol is supported by a lot of appliances like Amazon, uh, Amazon Elastic Gold Balancer, Traffic, Apache, Nginx, like really by lots. So this is a good, let's say, standard that can be used in many, many cases. And you usually use this when source not happens. But as you are, for example, operating on the TCP level, there is no way to use HTTP headers yet. So you need an alternative, and that could be a good one. 
Last but not least, out of the three um, of the three options is distributed logging and tracing. That's kind of the idea for, for now, let's say. The idea is to collect the source IP as soon as possible and put it in my distributed logging system because once I have it, I cannot lose it anymore. And then lose a tracing, uh, a tracing um, a system to actually track the requests and then do billing or whatever you need to do. The good thing in this is that um, it doesn't require you to do more complex network setups because the most distribution uh, logging and tracing stacks are already available inside your cluster. So you can just reuse existing tech. Um, however, it really relies heavily on the actual stack being deployed on your cluster. So it can be a bit of, uh, a bit of cumbersome, let's say, to, um, to actually get that running and get it working. Last but not least, I want to give you uh, two use cases and how that could actually work uh, in reality. So the first and probably the most easy use case that you can already um, think of is having the external load balancer uh, with a traffic policy. How this works then is you just deploy a service of a type load balancer, set the external traffic policy to true, the Kubernetes API has this information available, so the cloud provider can automatically configure a load balancer instance based on this. Um, so a potential client will like just point to public dem domain or IP again, which ends up at being the actual load balancer that has been just automatically configured. From there, he goes to a node which has the actual target pod running. QProxy will forward it to the, to the pod. All good, we're safe. The good thing here is that we have full automation because like the cloud provider is taking care of it and make sure that it works. Con and you can, you, can, you can imagine that already. That also really depends on the actual load balancer implementation. So if your load balancer doesn't support external traffic policy, for example, it, it won't help you because the, he could then target also this node and then you're still, you're still in the wilds and might have dropped requests. Secondly, um, is uh, capturing the source IP from the HTTP header, because that's also an option. Um, the good thing here is it's a really simple setup because it's just relying on the HTTP headers, which are part of the protocol. So the client talks to an HTTP reverse proxy. The HTTP reverse proxy appends the original client IP into the X forwarded from, as we just heard a couple of minutes ago, and forwards the request to the actual ingress controller. And then the ingress controller forwards the request to your backend or to your pod, better to say. And from there, the pod can just read out the value in the header and, and you're good to go. However, the large downside is it only works with HTTP because it's an HTTP field. But in most cases, or in some cases, let's say, that can already be sufficient. Then uh, just here are some sources in case you want to, to, to read up again on what I, um, what I just said and want to potentially learn out more about this. Um, also, uh, we published a well write paper called uh, Routing in the Cloud, which takes this topic, uh, which picks up this topic and uh, evaluates it a bit more because like you have more time to read it and don't need to present it. Um, so last but not least for the, for the actual presentation, thank you for being with me. Thank you for listening to me. And now I'm looking forward to all your questions. And well, I have to say, uh, I'm not looking forward to all the questions. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, well, my goodness, what a popular topic you have. Uh, so this is great. We've got um, lots, of, lots of attendees on the call, um, enough questions to, to fill the rest of our time. So let's see if we can choose a few that, are, that might benefit the most folks. Um, one was just maybe a brief point of clarification on the last couple of slides. Um, the, the question is that I, th I think you were speaking about an X forwarded from and just, just whether or not that might have been a typo with respect to X forwarded. Uh, X forwarded for, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, that was a typo. Sorry, that. Oh, very good. Uh, you. <laughs> You pull, you pull the Lee on that one because that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> so we've got that what's a, uh, a few other questions here so uh, one from Karthik is you know how do you expose traffic uh, um, how do you expose any 
How do you expose traffic ingress controller pod? Uh, as I said, pods, um, uh, pods are exposed through services and that's actually uh, the same for everyone, let's say. So um, let me bring up the slides. So let's say one of these pods is a traffic pod. You expose it, you expose it by, by a service. Or actually we can take this, this is better. This is your traffic pod. This is exposed over a service of type load balancer, typically. Um, and then, as I said, as there might, if, for example, if you're running a Google Kubernetes engine or Amazon or whatever, um, he, will, he, will, he will see this. He will spin up the cloud instance for you, the load balancer instance for you. And as this is of type, of type load balancer, which is an, uh, an enhancement of type, uh, of type load port, he will like route to the ports that are exposed from, from the traffic pod. And from there, you will have the routing and you will have it accessible from the outside. Very good, very good. Um, <clears throat> so some other questions here. Oh, well, <clears throat> um, the question is, can, can you please state some pros and cons in using traffic uh, as an ingress controller as versus using Nginx as an ingress controller? Yeah, sure. Um, the main difference, let's say, is, and I don't mean this like bad or something, just the just state of what it is. Um, Nginx has been made like really, really long ago because it was, it was solving a need back in the time. And um, therefore, for a long time, um, they, they have an arch architectural, I would, yeah, miss solution or misbehavior, let's say. Um, which is they need to restart the process when they reload configuration. And as we know, within the container world, containers can move like from one node to another in like milliseconds. So, they're, so they're, the endpoint might change. And this will require then the actual Nginx process to boot up again, um, which could potentially lose you some requests, let's say. So that's like one of the, of the main differences uh, between Nginx and, and traffic, because traffic is like built with that being in mind. So it auto, -configure, auto configures itself in some sort of um, hot reload fashion, and therefore you won't like lose requests. Um, and that's actually the, the, the most difference. Um, traffic has been built, as I said, for the cloud world in mind. So everything traffic does with fetching Let's Encrypt certificates and all of that is meant to make the containerized, uh, the containerized ingress working better. And engine X was, it works, but it was built for a different use case and it's just being ported over, so. All right, very good. Um, next question is, is it advisable to have more than one replica of the ingress controller for both performance and redundancy? <laughs> the, the answer sadly is it depends. Um, of course, having more than one replica is always something um, you, 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 should, you should keep in mind, at least for the failover, redundancy, high availability part. Um, however, especially in the terms of an ingress controller, it can be a bit tricky. It depends on what the ingress controller actually does. Um, if the ingress controller, like I said, is also, uh, for example, managing Let's Encrypt certificates for you, um, you bring in some challenges because then all your replicas need to have access to the same, to the same certificates for like um, to like have all the certificates available to do TLS termination and stuff. Um, but in general, it is something, if possible, given your case, I would go for because like it makes your life easier. Um, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I talk too long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Well, there's a related question to that. And the question is, how do you scale the ingress controller so that it's not a bottleneck? Um, what we typically do in this sort of uh, scenarios is also with our customers. Um, we assess the situation they are facing with them together. Because if someone tells you, okay, I'm having... I'm having resource resource issues on my on my um, uh, on my ingress controller. It can have two different reasons. Let's say one, of course, is that you might have like found a bug in your software, which might be causing I don't know memory leaks or something, and then you of course have to fix it. But the other is that they are just having too many requests, for example, per second, 
but this is sometimes a bad metric, but I will still go for it for, for now. Um, so that the ingress controller can just not go with it. So what we typically advise is start lower than you think, wait until you might potentially see that sort of behavior that requests are just getting slower, for example, and then spin up another replica if possible. And if then you're like a response time in itself is getting back to a normal state again, you know that you're good. And if you can scale it without having changes, you know, okay, like I can stay at my previous spot because I'm, I'm still good. I don't need to scale out. Oh, very good. Well, we'll keep on this theme for at least another question here. Yes. So the uh, related question is, can you have multiple ingress controllers that are load balanced externally for HA? Oh, that's actually a tricky question. Um, so when I when I got the question correctly, is um, you you will you will have multiple ingress controllers that are both exposed from the outside. Um, uh, okay, and that's tricky because um, if you like want to have two load balancers for HA reasons, they will have to work on the same ingress objects because like they need to have the same configuration, need to serve the same applications. Um, and that can be depending on what actual load balancer implementation you use, uh, ingress controller implementation, sorry. That can be tricky because um, it can happen that the ingress controllers fight for the actual ingress, let's say. So that could be, could be tricky. But what I think will be more complex is that uh, these days, current, usually ingress objects are configured by, um, by putting these annotations on the objects. And as annotations are basically just key value pairs, the keys will probably differ between various ingress controller, uh, between various ingress controllers. So, so you might have to have like the configuration twice, let's say once per ingress controller in order that both ingress controller can work with the actual objects uh, just fine. And then of course, if you have two external load balancers, you will have all your DNS records you have they will need to, of course, point to both load balancers as well. Otherwise, the request will not float. Nice. Well, if we could hand out kudos, I, I would give those to Jason for the, the, the trickiness of that question. That's great. Yeah, that was actually a good one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we do, have, we do have a few more minutes. We've got um, a number more questions to go through. So that, that's, um, let's, let's take this one next up. So the, the question is, um, do, do you have any take on the ALB? Um, I guess it's probably, I think the, the question is, do you have any take on the ALB to ingress controllers made available by cloud providers compared to bringing on your own ingress controller? Yeah, it's probably meant then ex, uh, to not bring like an own load balancer, I guess. Um, but yeah, I have a take on this. It's a personal take. Um, as I said also in the slides, um, typically going for, if you are in a cloud environment where your cloud provider can assist you with sort of like placing a load balancer there, um, I personally think it's always a good idea to do so because usually they're not super expensive to have and you just like get away of the complexity of managing those infrastructure on your own because the cloud provider just does it for you. Um, however, of course, if you need a specific feature, the cloud load balancer just plain doesn't offer, you don't have a choice. You then have to like manage your own infrastructure, bring it up, make sure it works correctly with your cluster. But typically, and this is something we see at our customers as well, if there is a cloud balancer available within the cloud they are running in, they go for it just, just for the easiness because usually it's fully automated and it just works. And that's, in, I would say, most cases worth the money uh, that one is taking from you. Understood, very good. Um, here's a, hopefully an easy one. Does, does traffic support proxy protocol to, to preserve the source IP address? Yes, it does. <laughs> that was really an easy one. <laughs> uh, here's a little more involved one. So the question is, if I expose the service as type load balancer, the ingress traffic first hits the load balancer 
and then it will be forwarded to the back end service, right? And not to the pod directly. So in your diagram. Uh, actually, for traffic, we go to the pod directly. Um, I, can't, I can't speak about all, uh, all other ingress controllers because I don't know them that deep. Um, but for traffic, we just use the service object to actually see the pods and directly forward to the pods. Um, because when we develop this, we figured that to be, uh, to be faster and a bit more stable for us. So we, we, we just take the service to see where we actually need to go and go there directly. Nice. All right. Um, very good. Here's another one. What is a recommended way and considerations that you might make like preventing DDoS to enforce authentication at the ingress service and routing down to the pods only if the client is authenticated? Well, what is my take or how would I do this? Or what yeah, is the... or like, yeah, like a recommended uh, considerations that you might um, mull over or... What I have, yeah. Um, that's a pretty tough one um, because this also very much relies on, on what is your exact case or better, what is your exact setup? Um, because typically that sort of attacks happen um, if you have like a certain size as a service or as an application or whatever. Um, and then there are like multiple ways to do so. Most, or not most, but some of the customers we have uh, solve that just, uh, let's say by money, they buy appliances like an F5 or whatever, place it in front of the actual English controller and let this appliance handle it. Um, that is of course something you could also have with like, for example, placing a Cloudflare and in and, and, and front of your, of, your, of your Kubernetes cluster, for example, which would also like take care of the DDoS. Um, for authentication, it also depends a bit. Um, it would be possible for, uh, for, for some ingress controllers that the ingress controller itself talks to a certain, to a certain service and forwards just the authentication request, basically, and then just lets the process, uh, the request go through once once this request is authenticated. Um, that would also be a possibility. So yeah, it, it really depends on what is your, your actual case. Nice. You know, it's a good question when, when there's an it depends in there somewhere. So that's, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's always hard to answer it in like a correct way because you don't know the exact situation then. So you just can give hints, but yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> nice. You know, I'll also say there's a couple of uh, folks on the call that have um, just highlighted the, I think, Nginx's ability and it sounds like F5's ability to also uh, directly forward traffic to pods. And so uh, wrapping those up, I think we, so we're, we've got about four minutes left. I, I'm not sure if, if Manuel, if you could withstand being um, hammered with um, this many more questions. Let me see if there's... <laughs> A couple of quick ones. Um, there, there are a couple that you know I think are asking for comparisons to other products or projects, and so maybe we'll forego those j just to not uh, you know put you in a overstress it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but here's one. Um, you know, there. I think there's just sort of a point of discussion that. Um, you, 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 one of the attendees is noting that many ingress controllers. Um, uh, uh, that are deployed that that come from cloud providers can maybe sync with external DNS. So yeah, that is true. That is true. Uh, for example, traffic can do this as well, and not just traffic. There are others that can do this as well. But that's pretty nice because how this works is um, Ingress objects has a status field where the load balancer can put their IP. And that's what the cloud provider or the ingress controller does then, like because the service is exposed over type load balancer. And so typically the cloud provider adds the external IP of the load balancer attached to the service, to the service object. And then the ingress controllers can basically copy this external IP into the ingress status, let's say. And then other tools such as, for example, external DNS, uh, can take this ingress records and can create automatically DNS records for you. So you don't even have to manage DNS records anymore. Well, very good. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, th thank you, Manuel. This, this has been a <laughs> fantastic uh, presentation. Thanks for having me. Yeah.
we've got we've got some questions that we haven't gotten to, but but uh, I, you've been bludgeoned with them already. So um, I do want to say uh, thanks to everyone for joining today. It's been a fantastic webinar. Uh, as a reminder, both the recording and the slides uh, will be online later today. The slides are available um, here. The links have been posted. Um, a link has also been posted in the chat as to where you can find the webinar recording. So. You know, we look forward to seeing you all at a future CNCF webinar and have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.